welcome back everybody welcome to our visitors um this uh for those for, for those of you that haven't been here before this is uh, uh the afternoon service and here we usually do just this is just our bible study this is where we where we uh i i will read i will exposit on on what we read and then we take questions we'll take we'll take some we have some conversation usually closer to the end um feel free if you have if you have some question to uh to offer and we will uh we'll get through that but before we get started let's talk about what we looked at last week which was psalm 15 any jared had his hand up first dad you're gonna have to be faster than that Yes, uh, Psalm 15, and as we're fixing to find out, Psalm 16, um, hold a lot of um, uh, prophecy regarding uh, the coming Christ. Uh, David, uh, David was given some inspirational foresight into a lot of his music, probably partially because Jesus, at least from a from a a lineage aspect on the fleshly side was was a was a child of David, um, and and had his blood running in his veins, uh, so to speak. So um, we will uh, we'll talk about that more. Anybody else? Really? It, it talks more about the attitude and the the approach that people who are serving. Serving God should have more so than just saying you are. Yeah, it it, it exposits throughout throughout the psalm the the type of person that was worthy of ascension, that was worthy to stand to, to stand righteous before God. Who 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 this person was, what qualities they must possess, and among those, especially as you look at at verse uh, verse three. Is the type of person that can that can look at another individual, see faults, and not mes- ne- not necessarily overlook or just shoo those thoughts away, but be able be able to have a love for that person despite their faults. Um, can 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 look at it's just just like the 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 woman that was caught in adultery, and Jesus Jesus did not hold her. Well, he held her accountable, but he, t- but he told her not to go and 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 to go and sin no more. That that the accu- that despite his ability to have accusations, he loved her more than the sin that she possessed, uh, which is a which is an earmark of the very salvation of which we claim. It is it is it is that love that Jesus possessed that drove him to the cross. That literally that that made him fulfill that obligation that he had set forth for himself. Otherwise, I think at the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have been like, I'm not doing this. Right. In fact, he asked not to, <laughs> not to have to do this uh, because he knew what it was going to be. But, but it, it, his, his love and his devotion to his mission uh, uh, t- took him to the cross and ultimately to, our, uh, to the sacrifice that would redeem his people. Um, and the other thing, characteristics kind of have a dual fulfillment in the sense that these are all things that we should strive to do as Christians if we are to serve the Lord but that's one fulfillment but the other fulfillment is that in order to truly abide in the holy hill as the psalm says we have to perfectly meet these conditions which none of us can do so we are kind of like a typological fulfillment but Christ is the true fulfillment of this characteristic right uh, i mean that, and that is, that is why that we're called christians we're christ like we're not christ <laughs> we're, we're we're every day we, every, and and I, I i made this comment at we 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 rise every day with with hopeful failure because we're going we're going to hope that we're going to do better but we're going to fail to live up to the example that christ set before us only to rise the next day Forgiven for everything that we failed the day before to try again, um, and uh, you know that can sound like a, a defeatist type way of thinking, but it it is the forgiveness for what we did not accomplish the day before that makes it worth trying again, 
the next day. Uh, and that brings us to Psalm 16, where we will have our lesson today. We have 11 verses, and that somehow stretched uh, five verses for nearly 40 minutes last week. So let's try to run through this as quickly as possible. Uh, we're we're going we're, we're going to set we're going to make it an hour, and we're going to set aside seven minutes for each verse. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, first verse, uh, well, the, the notation on the psalm is important for this one because it says uh, uh, Mik, Miktam of David, which is um, there are about three different things that I looked at that a lot of people, the direct translation, at least from Strong's Concordance, which is uh, which lays out the Greek and Hebrew of words that are within the Bible that are not translated directly into their English meaning, is, uh, uh, is a uh, engravement which is, which can mean a poem. So this might not have actually been a song. This could have been written literature, like most of the psalms were meant to be sung. Even poems of the ancient and medieval eras were usually accompanied by music, if not, if not outright sung. Uh, it, weirdly enough, although I'm not, I'm not someone who... Uh, really likes to listen to or uh, a, a aficionado of rap but rap actually holds a place in ancient like bardic tradition where you 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 speak at a rhythm with music and it's usually a poem uh and so this may have been more like that so david would accompany it with his heart and then speak this these verses out as probably to a meter to a to a timing um, the other two things that can mean is that this miktam can mean golden or secret. And there are a handful of psalms, I think it's in, in the late 50s to early 60s, yeah, yeah, uh, that also bear this miktam of David notation um, and deal with sim- similar um Similar things, but is it that, that this could be a that this could be translated as the golden secret? Uh, and what we find here is a lot of prophecy regarding our our Lord and Savior, which I think kind of directly hooks it to um, uh, chapter fifteen. Uh, in in that it's also going with that. So, uh, preserve me, O God, for in Thee do I put my trust. O my soul, Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Now, David offer, utters a quick prayer in verse 1 for preservation, for the, um, for the ability, uh, for, for God's ability to, as he puts, as David places his trust before the Lord, for the Lord to maintain the soul that that David feels that he is entrusted to him, uh, which we know is is perfectly and within the power and grasp of our God. Um, but I think for this chapter, it is very important to remember the time in which this was written. Now, I I, I read I read in a in a commentary that this particular psalm may have been written around the same time as the ark returned from the Philistines. Remember, the Philistines captured it in battle after uh, uh, Eli's two sons carried in there as some sort of totem to drag God into battle with them, and ultimately what happens, the Philistines caught it, and then the Philistines spent several uh, several weeks and months being afflicted before they put it on a cart and sent it back to the Israelites. Uh, and this return back to home it may have been along the same time that this was written. But I think it's even a, a, a bigger thing to remember that the Psalms and much of the Bible were written during times when kings and what we would probably consider more dictatorial forms of government were were commonplace were the thing now we live in a democratic republic here in the united states where at least to some degree we believe that the people possess power it is our vote it is our money to which that the government gains many of its abilities that we at any time could cut off the supply line, if you will, and they would be powerless and we would maintain power. We did this because we wanted to throw off kingship from being the 
main form of government. Now what this did though was, and I, I feel like this is the reason we don't see a lot of Great Awakening type um, revivals anymore, is because people in those times knew what being underneath a king was like. Right. Now, being a king and being a servant or a or a uh, in, in a king's fiefdom was to everything you were and everything you had was at the pleasure of the king. Lords maintained some power underneath, but they were they were merely governors underneath the king. It was the king that maintained all ability. Now this is a, a unique relationship, and I, and I said that we have something with, with, with you know where we have people have power. Even the lowest servant of the king made the king who he was. In, in, the, uh, in the placing of all their trust, and, and really all their, it was the king's duty. Let's say that I was the king and, and Brother Ken was, was one of my servants. Him placing his full trust in me as the king meant that it was my, not, not only my, my place, but it was my duty to protect him at all cost. That when things happened to Brother Ken, it was, it was for me to avenge. And so you have this reciprocal relationship between a king and his people where the people place their full trust in that king and the king, because of who he is and what he is and by right of his place and usually by right of his birth, held full responsibility for who they were. And who they were. And if, if someone attacked Brother Ken's vi uh, village home, that blow must not be, uh, not, must not be, uh, uh, go unanswered. I, I'm, I'm, I must, as the king, avenge him. And it is this relationship that much of the scriptures regarding our place before the Lord God is built upon. And we don't understand that as Americans because we've never had a king, especially nobody in here. We complain about our leaders. Uh, we, 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 we hope for four more, in four years we can throw off. Usually it doesn't matter who the leader is, whoever that person is, we can, we can show them the door and we can bring in in hopes that we'll find someone else. But not so in a, king, in, in a kingship. You are completely dedicated. But as the king, brother, brother Ken would be required to do full service for me. He works in my fields. He eats what I allow him to eat. He, and, and that seems barbaric to the American mind. It's like, well, you can't do that. He has rights. No, he doesn't. He is my servant, and I am the king. But being in this relation, and this is, this is the problem with freedom. Now, we're, getting, we're getting political now. For every freedom that you desire, your protection goes down. Those things can never intersect. If you give up freedoms, as in you bow your knee to a king, the, your protection goes up because that king is now has full responsibility for that person. So when we give up our freedoms to our government, yes, we're safer, but we have less freedom. Right. Safer. <laughs> now, now we're, 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 I, I'm, you have to, you, at some point you have to break these two ideas apart, though, because we're talking about earthly kings and we're talking about a godly king. Now, earthly kings, where they get the bad rap is they're still human. Now, a good king will do all these things. And praise be the Lord, we serve a good king. Amen. Everything, everything that he promises within the covers of the word of God, he will live up to Amen. if we live up to what we are supposed to do. Now, that's, that's the part of the problem that a lot of people don't like. Now, you cannot earn your salvation. You're, you're, you're either part of the kingdom or you're not. Right. You're a member of our Lord's court or you're not. But, Brother Ken, as the servant of, the, of, of myself, the king, he must do the things that I tell him to do or what happens. That's where you get the kings get the bad rap. If Brother Ken decides to rebel... 
and decides, I'm going to be a king unto myself. From my little village here, here on the edge of my Lord's kingdom, he will not see me at the periphery of his sight. And that's when I must rally my knights and go after him and meet out justice. Why? Because I'm the king. Amen. <laughs> and just in the same way, when we have, when we disobey the Lord our God, chastisement must come right. because he's the king. Yeah. And so when he says, and it's very, very small phrase, he says, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. He, as a servant of the Lord, is placing everything he is before the Lord in what? in turn for safety, for preservation, for help. And that relationship will stand as long as David stays there. Now, did David stay in that situation his whole life? No, of course not. He can't. He's human. But, but th that, this, this, this is where that descends from. Uh, he also he also says in verse two he talks about the um, uh, thou art Lord uh, thou art my Lord my goodness extendeth not to thee. It almost sounds like he's talking about the the I, I'm not going to uh, be good to you, my Lord. But what he's really saying there is my ability to be good does not even come close right. to the same level in which your goodness is. God is vast infinite goodness as he is vast infinite wrath as he is vast infinite power he is vast infinite all of these things and perfectly so and david saying i'm going to strive to be like you but my goodness cannot it doesn't hold a candle there's there's there, there, there's no way uh verse four their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another god their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou mayest, uh, uh, thou maintainest my lot. Now he says, th and this is the other side of that. If I, t if if brother Ken, the servant of the king, was to go and start serving another king, he said, maybe maybe let's let's upgrade brother Ken from serving him to a lord. He is a lord now, which means that they have they have a part of the kingly kingdom. And he's he's moving up every minute, guys. He's, he's, it won't be long before he's he's a vizier. Um, and, and if if I place Brother Ken as a lord, he's been a faithful servant, and I'm gonna say, you know what, you've been good, so I'm going to grant you more responsibility in my service. That's what the Lord does. He he took the talent from the one that buried it in the ground and gave it to the man who did good with the five talents. Remember, right. uh, and let's just say, Brother Ken. But then Brother Ken decides to turn his back on me, and he takes his little fiefdom underneath as as a lord. He has control of these lands, and he says, I'm going to pledge myself to the king that's over the hill. Brother Larry, he's going to pledge himself to that king. Well, that's what it's, of course, I'm going to be angry. And again, I must rally my knights and go and reclaim the land that Brother Ken has seceded to the king over the hill, Brother Larry. This is what he's talking about when he talks about going to other gods. When we allow ourselves to pledge ourselves, and, and I know there's not a lot of, actual idolatry or you know like falling before a object that's shaped like a animal or a person that goes on anymore but when you when you love something more than the lord you are creating that idol and that god is your god right. and you have seceded your servitude to that thing in place of the lord god and what happens it chastisement must be meted out as the king of the kingdom our lord god with all his love and kindness cannot bear a rebel yeah. now let's say that brother uh, that that brother ken does not heed my chastisement and continues to cede himself to the king over the hill it's probably going to end in death when we meet in battle yeah. and the lord is very clear about people that will not serve him they probably won't remain very long. But he goes on to say, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. David realizes, and Brother Ken, as the Lord of my, ki of my little kingdom, realizes that the king, our king, our Lord God, 
there is sustenance and safety within his fold. This is my portion. I talked about a little piece of land that, 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 that Brother Ken is Lord over. What do you think? That, that's the responsibility. That's things that God's put underneath your hand. He said, well, the Lord hasn't put anything about it. I don't, I don't have anything. I'm, I'm, I, do you have a family? That, that's something the Lord's put underneath your hand. Yeah. Do, you have, uh, do you have job responsibilities? That's something the Lord put underneath your hand. And then you say, well, well how, how is that? Well, look at Joseph. Mm-hmm. Everything that Joseph set his hand to do because he was serving God and doing everything to the best of his ability, everything prospered. Literally everything his hand touched prospered. We, we feel like, especially as, you know, as uh, decadent as Americans are, that the small things that we, we take for granted, you know, a warm place to sleep at night, a, you know, a food on our table, that these things are, not, are, 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 are basic and we look to others as goals for it's the American dream. We look to others to set our sights higher than our current station. When really, these, these, are, the thing, these are the tools that God has placed before you. And, and you should use them to, to do the work of the Lord. To, if I place Lord Ken over, let's say that he's over the fields where all the harvesting and, and the planting is done, I expect dividends to come out of the... Why? Because it's not just him that's going to eat from those fields. It's my entire kingdom. And the Lord expects us, as we, as we each tend our own part of the crop, to bring back something. To take the one talent and turn it into two. To take the two talents and turn them into four. To work with what we have been given and then have something to offer our God because He gave everything for us. And it is that relationship between king and servant that is imperative that we must maintain, that we must hold up to. Let's continue. The lines are falling unto me in pleasant places... Yea, have, I have a goodly heritage. Now, you can say that maybe David was talking about um, could have been Boaz and Ruth. You could, you, could, you, you could make those assumptions. I mean, you could, you could make those illusions. Jesse was not an evil man, by, from what I can tell from the Scriptures. Um, he wasn't a very perceptive man, <laughs> but he was, he was not an evil man, from what I can tell. But I believe this is one of the first things in this psalm that begins to talk about our Lord. Jesus, on his fleshly side, through Mary, um, would be a, be a descendant of David. And David talks about these lines, which um, my father is big into genealogy. It's all, it's all lines and brackets, is it not? Uh, and, and, you, and this bloodline, David begins looking down through history and, and through revelation from the Spirit of God says, some good things are coming. Amen. Some, some great things are coming. And they're coming from me. I was I was chosen to bear a bloodline that will that will that will bless every nation on the planet that will that will that will touch millions of hearts and souls. Um, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. Uh, now he says. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. Now, I actually talked to a gentleman. I'm, I'm, for those of you that are new here, I'm, I'm a barber by trade, so I do a lot of talking. Um, and I was talking to a, a gentleman just about this the other day, how the people in the United States and, and people in general, uh, we like our own opinions, but we don't like anyone else's opinion. Uh, and specifically in the generation that has risen around social media, have lost the ability to hear someone else's ideas, whether they agree with them or not, acknowledge them, maybe even learn something from them, perhaps even strengthen my own argument, and be able to shake that person's hand and walk away, not having fought for a moment. (laughs) We've lost that ability to... uh, to see other people and what they think and how they think and move on. It was this very ability that gave Paul the power to preach on Mars Hill. He looked at the altar to the unknown God, and from there he began a message. 
Now, Paul could have just screamed about their idolatry for a half hour, and I doubt he would have gotten very far. That's not what he did. We, 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 we don't give, and, and in the same way, he, says that, but he said, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. More than not being able to take counsel from each other, we don't take counsel from God very well. Because his ways are higher than our ways, and his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That's a paraphrase. His ability to see the larger picture sometimes baffles us. The Lord says, go here. And we say, why? It is this very idea that led Jonah to the places that he ended up. The Lord said, go to Nineveh, because he knew that Nineveh was ripe for a revival. And Jonah said, nah, I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going as far away from Nineveh. If you know anything about how the ancients viewed the world, Tarshish was near the Straits of Gibraltar, which was literally the edge of the world. There was nothing but the Atlantic Ocean, and nobody had sailed to the Americas yet as far as history has been able to tell us. So he said, you want me to go to Nineveh, a great metropolitan city, I'm going to jump on a ship and literally go to the edge of the world away from it. That's what he said he was going to do. And God said, okay. And just like when I had to rally my knights to get Lord Ken here uh, back in the, uh, back in the uh, kingdom's fold, the Lord said, I have an instrument that will be perfect for teaching Jonah about running away from God. And that was first a storm and second a whale. And he put him in the belly of the great fish and he sat there for three days until... Uh, he realized that the Lord was who he said he was, and when he spit him out on the ground, Jonah covered what should have been a much further journey in a single day. Isn't it interesting how we can get God's work done whenever we've been punished a little bit? Very interesting. So when the Lord tells us to do something, that's not a suggestion. That's not as a king. Again, back to this idea of this relationship. If I tell Brother Ken, okay, you're back in the fold now. We fought these battles. I feel like you're a loyal servant, but we're going to find out how loyal a servant you are. I actually want you to go and attack the king over the hill now. You were pledged to him. I want you to go and, and beat down that stronghold. And Brother Ken would say, why? You, you don't need to know why. Maybe I, as the king, know that he's rallying forces against us, that if we allow the king over the hill, to, to abide much longer, that things will be far worse. My spies and my intelligence, I know, I know, I know all in the kingdom, and, and, and Lord Ken only knows the few things. He has a decision to make, though, doesn't he? The king over the hill is powerful. The king over the hill is strong. But I know that the king over the hill is spread pretty thin right now, and that if he will just rally the handful of knights that are loyal to himself... He can take out that, that person. But how does, how does he know that? And how do we, as servants of God, know that the, that the things of God, that when he says, go and do this random thing that makes no sense for us to be doing, is a worthwhile venture? Well, you don't. Right. You're not meant to. This is an opportunity for faith. Why would Jonah go to Nineveh? Let me tell you something about Nineveh. Nineveh was an Assyrian city, and the Assyrians had beat the Israelites mercilessly. That's why Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah didn't like them. Why would I go and save them? What have they done to deserve it? Well, the Lord God could have made that very same claim of us. Why would I go to save them? What have they done to deserve it? That's not, but that's not the attitude that we should have. We rise and we run to Nineveh. We make a, we make a quick journey of what should have been a longer trek. He says, My reins also instruct me in the night season. Now he's talking about the reins of a bridle of a horse. Horse is, especially when they've got their blinders on, they can't see a lot. They're not meant to because horses are easily spooked. We're easily spooked as servants of God. We, 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 don't, we don't like danger. No one likes danger, we, but we certainly don't like being led around that way. And it is the reins of our God sometimes pulling us oddly to the right when we feel like intuitively we should be moving left. But little we, do we know that in his eye, he can see the pitfall, right. the serpent on the path. Go right, 
Go right. Now we can fight it. A horse can fight their reins. But where does that, what destruction lays before us? And if Brother Ken falls, because he is a member of this assembly, who falls behind him? Who's bright? A lot of times horses run in teams, especially when there's a heavy load. Sometimes, uh, if you look at the Old West, a stagecoach had a multitude of horses pulling it. If he falls, at least two other horses around him, they're getting pulled down too. They're going to get tangled up in the body of the other horse. The reins are going to get pulled in an odd direction. They're not going to be able to pull appropriately. And all of a sudden, we have a giant mess. Why? Well, if he just listened, if he just pulled to the right, all would have been well. Nothing would have happened. And as I say this, nobody, Brother Ken is a very nice person. I'm just, he, he is before me and I'm using him as an example. <laughs> um, um, uh, where are we at? Uh, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Amen. There is the comfort that you seek. When God tells you to do something odd, and I'm always, I always thought it was interesting, and especially in you see in these people's bathrooms and stuff, you have the footprints in the sand poem about, and it's it's an entertaining, you know, it's true, I guess, but there's nothing inspired about it, I guess. It's just is it's just an interesting little poem, but the the good news about doing things that don't make sense to us that God is telling us to do, and the thing that we forget because we're thick-headed and and we're stubborn, is. If we're moving the direction that God wants us to, guess who's walking there with us? Yeah. Lord God. What, what, why, why should we fear? Amen. This is the same person that drowned the armies of Pharaoh, that flooded the earth with waters, that was able to, to and make peace be still. Amen. The, 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 the storms obey. That was able to look into a man that had a legion of demons in him and cast him out at a wave of the hand. Uh, a, a man who struggled beneath the load of his cross until Simon took it up and then fought his way to Calvary on less blood than, it, than we have to, that, to support brain function and then suffered for hours longer. That same man walks beside you if, if you walk the way he wants to. Let's get back to our, our king example. If brother... Ken goes and fights the king over the hill. Maybe he doesn't realize it, but I'm routing them from the rear. Yeah. I am there as the king. I'm still protecting him. I am not going to place a servant who has placed full trust in me in danger yeah. because that's not what a good king does. Amen. Amen. He doesn't know, but as he joins battle with the king on the hill, all of a sudden he hears the trumpets and sees the banners of the king. Help has arisen from a place that he didn't know was even possible. And just in the same way, we get in these situations and we're like, Lord, we can't go on. And all of a sudden, blindsided, literally by the help of the Lord. We don't know where it comes from. It's like the wind. You don't know where it comes or where it goes. But you hear the sound and you can feel the effect and you can see it around you. The Lord will move to help us if we do the things that He wants us to do. Let's continue. Uh, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall also rest in hope. Now I think this is another uh, looking forward to Christ here, where He says, uh, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall rest in hope. So He as he has placed this trust in God, as he is following the reins of God, he looks forward and he sees a time where, you know, my, my soul is going to be saved. And he says, but my flesh is going to, where's where David's bones now? P- probably in a, the ground somewhere, maybe just dust. He's been dead for literally thousands of years. But one day, a trump will sound Amen. and the dead will rise and his hope for his flesh, he'll be caught up and changed. And that, that perfect flesh will meet a perfect spirit. And we can all serve together. Mm-hmm. And he was looking forward to that time. For that will not leave my soul in hell, neither will I, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see 
corruption. Now here he's specifically talking about the Lord. If you look, if you're, if you look in your Bible, you'll see that Holy One capitalized. That is the that is a that is a name. You capitalize the 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 names of things. And here he's referring uh, referring to the uh, to to our Lord God. That will shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Now, let's say that after the battle, we have vanquished. We finally vanquished, Brother Larry. It's taken all, it's taken all service to do it, <laughs> but we have finally, we've finally taken him out. I see the faithfulness as the king of Brother Ken, and I say, you're going to be my personal advisor. You're going to sit at my right side. Does that make him the king? No, we're never going to usurp God. One person tried that. And he failed mightily. <laughs> um, but to sit down at the king's table is a blessed thing. You see that that David says here, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Why are we so sad? Why are we so beaten down? I'll tell you why. It's because we do not walk his path. We do not look ahead for better things like David did here. We don't... We, 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 we actively do not seek out the bigger picture. And when we do that, when we don't walk by the Lord, of course we're bitter. Of course we're sad. Of course we're, we're depressed. Of course we feel alone. Because we are. The one person that gave you life doesn't walk beside you. Why? Because you won't walk beside of him. A rebellious servant is never going to have the protection of their king. A rebellious servant is not going to gain... We get in these situations where we, where we get in physical trouble, sickness, illness, uh, the, the uh, loss of a home, all these things. And then we scream to the heavens asking for help. Now let's say that the story that I told of Brother Ken, the now right-hand man, did not turn out quite that way. Let's say that he stayed loyal to the king over the hill. And then sudden trouble come. Maybe famine, maybe illness racked his family. The king over the hill, he's not going to help. Why? Because he's not a good king. Brother Larry is a very nice person as well. Uh, <laughs> But he's not going to help. And then Brother Ken comes back to me and says, Will you please help? We're starving. We need help. You, you got to be kidding me, right? The Lord is not a flesh and blood man, but he has laid out some very clear guidelines in the scripture about who receives blessings and who doesn't. Yeah. It's a, your salvation is not a contract, but your service is. He wants blessings. If his kingdom, if, if his fiefdom wants to be fed, he needs to be loyal to the king. And we can't expect to throw our hands up in the face of God and the first sign of trouble run back to him, expect him to shower blessings down on us. That's not how it works. Odds are you're not even going to get into the throne room. Odds are if Lord Ken decided to come back to me after being uh, 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 having abandoned me for months on end, probably the guards are going to stop him at the door and throw him in the dungeon. Because yeah. why should he be able to see the king right. when he has no service? Amen. We're very, very lucky as Christian people to have a God that is far more forgiving than an earthly king right. that, can, that can look past the failures and the awful things that we do and like the parable of the prodigal son and the father throw his hands open put a new coat on him put the put the ring back on his finger and let's have a feast yeah. my son's returned home yeah. Amen. but we don't oftentimes we don't make that journey right. are there any questions comments concerns Tomatoes, whatever you want to throw out here, uh, on Psalm chapter 16. Yes, brother. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 
Yep. Well, if there's no other thing, then we will uh, be dismissed. Um, uh, we'll have uh, Brother Junior. Why don't you lead us in a word of prayer to dismiss us? Mm-hmm.